using using blockchain on logistics and business automation and our presentation today business automation in the new movement and sorry in the new economy of movement i'm going to stop sharing now and give the meeting over to tram and tram i believe you have a deck so excellent you're able to share welcome Thank you. I came from an art background, so I always have to have something visual. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you for having me here. Uh, a slight correction. I, I haven't spoke to supply chain before. I've uh, spoken okay. to the social impact group, but not supply That's chain. Right. Not yet. Today's the first. So good Excellent. to see everyone. Uh, my, I think my colleague did, uh, Rajat, uh, spoke. Yes. With Yes, so he was here. Yes. I think you maybe. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so during my talk, it's very informal. If you have questions, uh, stop me anytime, and, and we can can answer, or you can wait until the end. Entirely up to you. Uh, my name is Trambo. Um, I am CEO and co-founder of Mobi. Uh, full disclaimer, as you can tell, I'm not a technologist, so uh, this talk is not very techy at all. Um, but um, it's, it's more like the high level overview of what we're trying to do and what we've done so far. I started out in chemistry and then I went on to art conservation and for a couple decades, uh, work on heritage preservation uh, and conservation projects around the world uh, for an uh, organization like UNESCO uh, and the Getty here uh, based in Los Angeles. And uh, in May of 2018, along with Chris Ballinger, uh, my co-founder, uh, we launched uh, Mobi. Uh, we are also married, so that was a lot of togetherness <laughs> during the pandemic <laughs> shutdown. Um, so a little bit of history about uh, Mobi. We launched in 2018, uh, but our history went back a couple years before that. Uh, many of our now Mobi members were very excited uh, about blockchain and experimented with many proof of concepts. Uh, they all found that putting a vehicle data or service onto a chain, that was easy, but these applications weren't able to scale. And there were a couple of reasons uh, for that. Uh, one, the industry needs standards, uh, standards on like how to identify a vehicle, people, things, trips, uh, when does the trip begin, when does it end, how to connect the whole trip, how to transfer and share data and how to settle transactions. All those need standards uh, so that we can communicate at the same level. And then two, companies were using decentralized technologies, uh, blockchain, but they were building centralized blockchain platforms and were not able to get others uh, to go on to them. Uh, for example, we have um, one OEM uh, that built a mass multimodal platform, uh, but couldn't convince um, others to go onto the mass multimodal platform. We have another OEM spend a lot of money spent us, uh, building a supply chain platform. Um, but again, it was their platform and couldn't convince other automakers to go on to them. Uh, we have a logistic uh, company. And when I talk, spent $54 million building a logistic platform. Uh, again, can convince others to go onto them. So what we learn, of course, is that centralized platforms don't scale. And this is why uh, Mobi was launched in 2018. Uh, along with our members, we are creating standards and building the Web3 uh, infrastructure uh, for industry-wide business automation. So why is industry-wide business automation important? Uh, most of the productivity that we have gained within the last 50 years or so uh, came from business automation enabled by digitization of internal processes only. Um, very little was from the automation of extended value chain uh, involving unrelated, untrusted parties. And, uh, and even when those attempts happen, they tend to be with a couple or very small group uh, of organization, so they're not really scalable to industry-wide. And from the beginning, the big picture for Mobi um, 
it has been this and it's still the same is that the convergence of all the technologies that you see here uh, will permit any connected entity, a person, a vehicle, a device, a piece of infrastructure uh, to have a trusted identity that can directly communicate and securely transact with another connected entity. And in, in doing so, not having to go through someone else's uh, centralized platform. And once you have a trusted identity that you can link with location into a verifiable trip, then you have the pay-per-use economy, which we call the new economy of movement. So why is trusted identity important for business automation? Um, 60 to 65% of internet traffic is uh, from bots. Uh, and 40% of total internet traffic is from malicious bots. And we have 15 billion connected things today. Uh, that number will double every three years. Now with the, um, so how do you do business with something if you don't know who or what it is? And then the arrival of genetic AI will make this problem dramatically more important. Uh, and this cartoon is was from 1997, I think. I can't remember now. And I think many of you have seen it. <laughs> but I think the, the problem is still true today. So across um, the, any connected ecosystem, mobility, telecom, insurance, and we're working with, with those uh, as well, including uh, semiconductor chips and all that, they have hundreds, if not thousands of connected um, stakeholders. And they all have their, uh, not just um, private, but public as well. And they all have unique databases. They all have unique processes. They all have regulation on how to handle business and customer data. Uh, and these databases don't talk to each other. If they do, um, it's, it's a risk for the business. So currently it is impossible to automate business processes without opening up your own uh, databases. Um, so for industry-wide industry business automation to happen, um, the solution needs to have the five things that you see here on the screen. One is zero trust authentication. So that means every entity must be identified and authenticated for every transaction. And then all the data or the claims uh, must be non-repeatable. The second thing is data privacy. Uh, that is uh, regulatory compliant. Um, of course, GDPR and not in the state. I think we have four or five states that have uh, similar uh, uh, regulations as well. Um, and the ability to limit access to intended recipients only. And the third thing is um, data security and selective disclosure. So instead of connecting to uh, databases and doing business, uh, we want to be able to push the data to the edge and do the transaction at the edge. And the ability to selectively disclose and verify information at the moment of transaction uh, without having to store the data before, during, or after the transaction is extremely important. Um, and then the, uh, they have, the solution has to be affordable, interoperable, scalable, and extensible. So that means the solution has to be standard-based, platform agnostic, and that would have to work with any legacy system um, so that the mom and pop shop can do it in the supply chain. Uh, and they, there's no costly new infrastructure uh, that they have to build. They don't have to to pay for integration and they don't have to pay for maintenance every couple of years or so. And uh, last but not least, uh, of course, is that we have to have a solution that is not a centralized platform that is owned by one. Uh, it has to be community owned and operated uh, and uh, open source. Tran, can I, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, back on the uh, standards, uh, item that you mentioned there. How how did you decide what standards to use or leverage there and when do you need new ones there? And if that's something later on, great. Um, it just seems to be an eternal problem within blockchain. Yes. Um, so we we are, um, uh, well, there's a couple of things. I'm going to 
the next couple of slides, I can talk about them. Is that okay? Um, sure thing. Okay. Yep. So I do have one question around. Oh, sorry. Back to the slide okay. again. <laughs> I apologize. On the oh, decentralization, no, no. Um, can you expand on that just a tiny bit? Are, are you talking about the node operators, the validators of a blockchain would own? I wasn't sure what you meant by own infrastructure. So if they used, if their node somehow was on Microsoft Cloud, you're not talking about that, are you? Um, a little bit of that, but mainly for here is about centralized platforms. Uh, we all know about centralized platforms like mm -hmm. Google, Google, Facebook, and all that. And then uh, the the three um, example I gave earlier, I didn't give name, but but one of the major OEM built a mass multi model platform. It is a centralized platform, and okay. so uh, one so the auto automakers. Why would we go on to that? It it belongs to you. It's behind your firewall. And then another one built a supply chain platform using uh, blockchain. And also it is a centralized platform. They control it, it's behind that firewall. And so nobody else would go into it. And, and this is really important message to our members is that you can't build a platform uh, and say that this is yours and then want others to go onto it. So, any other questions on this? Okay, so keeping all these requirements in mind, uh, we come up with um, a solution that we call self-sovereign um, digital twins or SSDTs. Um, in the US, uh, I've, I've seen a comedian recently that made fun of the fact that there's so many acronyms for everything. And he did a whole segment on it, which is true because I see a lot of acronyms on my slide deck. Um, so self-sovereign digital twins. The concept of uh, digital twins was uh, generated by NASA back in the, the 1960s. Uh, essentially, it is a digital representation of an object or a system that captures static and near real-time data uh, throughout the whole life cycle of the object. And um, for us, self-sovereign digital twins are digital twins that can self-generate verifiable credentials so that they can um, they identify, they can, uh, they have the uh, ability to authenticate uh, identity and selectively disclose pertinent information um, at the moment of transaction and ability to um, verify um, the, the data that's given to them. So that means, again, they don't have to connect to centralized databases, they can do transaction at the edge. Uh, they are universal translator, uh, encrypted log data, well, so this is really important. Only the controller or the owner of the SSDT self sovereign digital twins has access to it and nobody else does. Um, and the SSDTs are standard based. This is the first standards that uh, we are talking about for the ecosystem. They, we use uh, W3C standards, uh, the World Wide Web Consortium, which produce standards uh, for the internet. And the standards we've been using here are the DID. And, and the VC standard, decentralized identifiers and verifiable credentials. Um, so the, the um, VC standard was um, approved a few uh, years ago. The DID standard uh, was approved uh, last year in August, I think. And uh, it was, it's been worked on for many, many years. And actually Moby's first standard ever in uh, 2019 was the Mo Mobi VID, Mobi Vehicle Identity. And that standard was based uh, on using a decentralized identifier. So we were using W3C DIT standard before it became a formal standard. We were working with them uh, to understand. And I think many of you know this already, but it took a while. Um, when it was first voted on, uh, everybody voted yes for for the standard, there were three organizations that uh, didn't like the standard and object to it. And of course, um, I think you can take a wild guess uh, as who they are. They were Google, Apple, and Mozilla. <laughs> um, so these are the, the two standards that we use for uh, the ecosystem on identity. So if you look at uh, the, these uh, things that are listed here for the self-sovereign digital twin, they fulfill most of these requirements. Uh, they are 
um, <clears throat> essentially zero trust authentication. Uh, they use, uh, they enable data privacy, uh, security, and selectively disclose information. Uh, they are standard based for interoperability, scalability, and extendability. They are affordable because users don't have to build new infrastructure. Um, SSDTs can be an app that you download to the device uh, of your choice, and it can be stored in, in the cloud of your choice, of course. And uh, the last thing we need to address is how do we make sure that it's not one entity that owns the infrastructure? So to do that, um, this is, uh, this, I think you've seen, many of you probably have seen this, uh, this and VC and this whole verifiable credential ecosystem. Um, so Mobi is a technology agnostic. Um, so we don't endorse any specific blockchain. Um, 10 years from now, we don't know which blockchains will still be around. So we, that's not our job. Our job is um, to work with blockchain because we, we see the potential of blockchain and, and we love all the um, capabilities of blockchain. But we leave it to the expert to build out um, that. Um, so what we instead, we are building the layer two which is um, think of it as a trust layer um, that is uh, enable us to anchor the did the decentralized identifier onto our blockchain. Uh, <clears throat> so, and then the third layer on top um, is uh, Zootopia, which is uh, where the self-sovereign digital twins reside. And this is where they transact uh, with each other. So the, the POC of 2016 and 17 that I mentioned uh, has proven to our ecosystem that blockchain works. That's, that's not that important. Uh, that, um, what is important is how blockchain is being used. Um, I've always said there's just 200 ways of cooking chicken and rice. If you look up on the internet, every culture has a chicken and rice dish. It's how you make it that's important. So within Mobi, how we use um, blockchain is very specific and we only use it, using it to have did registry and that's it. We're not storing any data or any PII on chain. We don't recommend it and our members uh, in this ecosystem does not do that. And right now the two blockchains that we anchoring to um, is Fabric um, and uh, Ethereum. So every did that we create is uh, deposit onto the 15 nodes that we have so far in Fabric and then also onto Ethereum as well. So I think, I, do I need to go into this whole ecosystem at all of what's going on here or should I skip that? <clears throat> well, you can spend like an hour on it. If you're really <laughs> dug into it, which you don't. I think it could be yeah. interesting just to hear a couple of minutes on it. Okay. All right. So a couple yeah. of minutes. Thank you. Really in simple term, I um the way I describe the ITN integrated trust network here is like a phone book. It's been a while since many of us have seen a phone book. I'm you know, I'm old enough to remember when they drop the white pages and the yellow pages at the front porch. <laughs> And so now Google has the, become the de facto phone book. Um, we Google everything, but uh, we try and this ecosystem is gonna get try to get us away from that. So, so this is the public communication channel. Uh, you deposit the did, and then once you look up the services of a business, like in the yellow pages, you can usually see an ad, you see a business and they list all the services that they do. And then there's a phone number that you can pick up the phone and contact them. So essentially, this is the same thing. It's a public uh, publication. You can look up services. And then once you find a business you want to do a business with, you pick up the phone and call them. And when you pick up the phone and call them, you communicate in a private communication channel. And, and that's up here. And we use verifiable credential uh, to do that. And usually when you see this whole ecosystem, it's being built by one organization, one company. Uh, and we think that is way too much power uh, for one organization to have because you have the, the agreement, the transaction, and then you have the did, the signature that's in them. Um, so, so that's way too many things that one company have. 
So we actually even split this up into two, and we these are two uh, legal entity that we register, uh, and they are separate companies. All Mobi you know, members in good standing uh, have a little bit of shares in in, in both of these uh, companies, um, but we will soon uh, also reach out to VC uh, of our members and external to invest in it because we can't do this based on just membership fees alone. Um, we are a non-profit uh, startup, so it's like a double whammy, no money and no money, right? <laughs> so um, the next, I have, I think two more slides or, or something to this, um, which explain what exactly how we do the verifiable credential. Um, and um, you don't need to read this, please. I'm just gonna walk through it really quick. Um, so this is a, a battery birth certificate verification. Um, I think some of you might have heard of the battery passport, correct? Mm -hmm. So um, the EU Commission has uh, written a regulation. It hasn't been signed yet, um, but it's been drafted. And the second draft was uh, earlier this year released. Essentially, it requires that uh, if anybody produce a battery uh, greater than two, um, and I think you have to have a battery passport, which means pretty much every battery, except for the little ones. And uh, the battery passport, you don't have it, you cannot sell it in, in uh, um, Europe. So that is really a big worry uh, for uh, auto manufacturer and the battery manufacturers in our ecosystem. Um, so uh, this is an example of how a verifiable credential works um, in our ecosystem. Uh, Let's say we have battery manufacturers. We have OEM, which is stand for just uh, vehicle manufacturers. And we have, let's say, a couple here. And they all have uh, their own legacy uh, system uh, and databases. And none of them are connected or want to connect to each other uh, to do transactions. So how do we make it so that they are interoperable and can send messages that everybody can understand? So that means everybody would uh, self-create a self-sovereign digital twin. And then uh, once they generate that, uh, they can uh, do this kind of messaging. So the battery manufacturer creates a battery and then also create a battery self-sovereign digital twin. Then the manufacturer will send a message to its own um, SSDT and say, hey, can you get a did, um, a decentralized identifier create for this battery, please? Then that message get translated uh, into uh, a accepted protocol uh, and send that message to a Citopia node. Citopia node then send a message to the ITN, and the ITN's job again is only to create did uh, and and anchor them onto blockchain. Uh, so then ask the ITN please create a did for this battery. The ITN creates it, deposit it uh, onto uh, blockchains, then sending the message back to the Zootopia node and say, hey, this is the did you requested. Zootopia then send that message back to the battery manufacturer, SSDT, and give it to it. Then um, the manufacturer, SSDT, will send the did to the battery, SSDT, and now the battery has that store in the battery. The second thing is the battery birth certificate. And the battery birth certificate is just like yours and my birth certificate is static information. It's kind of boring, you know, how, where were you born, which hospital, how big were you, <laughs> who were your parents? Um, but those are all needed um, to be able to trace back to the manufacturer. Uh, it's the whole lifetime of it, how many other credentials that they, they received, that's the important thing. Uh, so then they create the battery birth certificate with all the data schema that's required. Uh, and this is a MOBI standard. So earlier, I forgot, I'm sorry, who asked me about which standard you, you decide. So we use W3C standard for this uh, implementation of the ecosystem, but within the business processes, we have uh, members sit down and walk through what would a battery birth certificate look like? What kind of information should be in there? Uh, and, and so uh, this is that standard, a MOBI standard that we use. Uh, so once the battery birth certificate as a verifiable credential has been created, and then it gets sent to the battery uh, SSCT and deposit in there as well. So now the battery has the DID and the battery birth certificate. Let's say an OEM come along, let's say a BMW comes along and say, um, I need to install this battery in my vehicle. 
uh, how do I verify that this battery is uh, has that history and, and the passport that's required and how do I authenticate it? So then uh, BMW will send a message to the battery SSD team and say, hey, can you give me your credentials so I can verify you? The battery present the DIT, the battery birth certificate. Instead of trusting the battery, um, you need to verify and validate it in this zero trust ecosystem. Then the uh, then BMW will send a message to Zootopia and say, hey, can you verify this for me, please? Zootopia send a message to the ITN to verify it, and make sure the did signatures are correct. Uh, the ITN said, yep, you're safe, you can proceed. Zootopia note then send a message back to BMW and say, you can proceed, battery safe, install it. And then let's say we're in a share economy and a couple of automakers um, have agreement to use the same battery. Uh, and let's say Daimler came along and used the same battery and they need to install it now. They can do the same authentication messaging again. And so that in our ecosystem, this is how we verify and validate um, all, the, all the transaction without having to really pass messages. I mean, passing data, uh, you pass a verification. Any questions on this? before I move on to the next to the last slide. Is this already being used? And so by how many companies and approximately how many um, BBCs have been issued and have any of the companies given feedback on the impacts they've had to their operations? So we are in the, the pilot trial right now. Um, it's, it's, recently we have had two major OEM major vehicle manufacturers uh, that uh, did this pilot. Uh, and, and this is pretty historic because usually uh, they don't speak to each other. And for them to be able to sit down and do this pilot and, and uh, finish this, it was pretty fantastic. And now we are having more of, of our members uh, joining this pilot. Um, so, so it's going to take a little time. Um, but um, as you know, R&D takes a, a little while. We, we can't use it right away yet. So, Any other questions on this? The only question I had was, um, um, this follows along, I just keep thinking of the hyperlink or thing, but um, when when you ask for verification, it just gives back a, it doesn't give back data, does it? It just gives back a verifier. I don't know if it's a sig hash signature. It doesn't really... It doesn't have to give out all this information; just gives an okay. Uh, correct. And okay. the, the next, the next slide, I have an, another example with some code in it as well, which I don't know how to code, but I can show it to you. Any other questions on this slide? Uh, Daniela, I see a hand up. I don't know if it's old or new. I think I think that's been up for a while. I'm not sure if yeah, I think that's been up for a little while. Okay. All right. Let me go to the next slide. So this is an example of a zero knowledge proof uh, that uh, we've been working on. Um, so one of the, another pilot which is recently completed uh, is called the dealer floor plan audit. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, uh, there are dealerships that sells vehicles, right? And and those dealerships, they don't buy the vehicles with their own money. Maybe the little ones do, but the really big ones that have hundreds of vehicles, they have a bank that we, they work with. And the bank um, lend them money to pay the auto manufacturer to purchase these, these cars. So then the bank wants to make sure the cars are still on the lot and not sold yet because under the agreement, when you sell a vehicle, you have to return the money immediately so the bank can use that money for something else and make more money. Uh, but there are a few uh, dealerships that don't disclose right away that they have sold the vehicle so that they can keep the money in their book in the bank and do some something else with it. So so the, deal, uh, the lenders need to go physically right now onto the dealership lot. Somebody with a paper clip and it and check out the vehicle. And it's a really um, labor intensive process and it's a slow process and you can't do it you know, all the time, right? So, so it, um, according to Accenture, if you can automate this process, 
uh, within the U.S. alone, you can save four to five hundred million dollars a year. So, so it's a big problem. Um, we did the pilot on how do you um, <clears throat> verify that the vehicles are on the lot uh, when we know that location is PII. You can't you can't store location. Um, so, what we um, did for this pilot was that we used zero knowledge proof service that offered by Zootopia. Uh, inside a verifiable credential. Um, so let's say you are the lender, the bank, uh, you have an SSDT, and then you ping the vehicle SSDT to ask the vehicle, are you in this geofence location? And the geofence location is the dealership. And then the vehicle then would answer back, uh, would approve that say yes or no, I'm, I am in, in this location or not. And if they say yes, fantastic. If the vehicle say no, I'm not in that geofence location, that means it's out. It's been driven around. It could be driven around by uh, a, uh, a customer and you don't want to know. That's, that's PII. Um, so let's say you ping, the lender ping the vehicle once an hour for 24 hours straight, for three days straight or continuously all the time while the vehicle is not being sold yet. And if the answer is, mostly yes, unless once in a while it goes out for a test drive uh, or in the service department, uh, then that's fine. But if it's saying no a lot, especially 3 a.m. in the morning, and if it's 3 a.m. in the morning, everybody's sleeping. If the vehicle is not in the lot, then maybe there's an issue. Uh, so then the lender needs to uh, have a, a procedure on how to follow up on this. So as I mentioned, uh, VIN number is PII. Location is PII. How do you do this proof without storing that? Um, so uh, the, the proof that the vehicle sent back first, uh, the input into the zero knowledge proof, you have the VIN number here, the leaf. You have the latitude, you have the longitude, and this is the approved latitude and longitude, which means this is a geofence location of the dealership. And then it goes through the zero knowledge proof. And as you can see, when it's sent back a verifiable credential would approve there's no clear text of the VIN number or the location. And that's um, how we also um, do data privacy in a verifiable credential as well. Any questions on that? Yeah, just one. Um, so that JSON file you've got up over here, that, is that format um, coming off some standard or is there some way that uh, another system can retrieve that format to understand what they need to, the JSON format they need to send over to, uh, over, over to the, to get the credential, the verification? So um, let me see if I got your question correctly, because I'm not a technologist, so you might have to send a question later and I send it to our, our tech team. Um, so so this will be a somewhat of a standard for Mobi members, like we'll- Oh, okay, this. okay. So, so and then, be, okay. yeah, so, and then we um, also, um, this is a service of Zootopia. So the zero knowledge proof uh, services is a service that Zootopia will offer uh, to members um, to, so that they can do the extra layer of data privacy as well. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, and this is um, my, Last slide, um, we are doing many uh, pilots with our members and these pilots, we are not building these products. This is just to demonstrate uh, the uh, the infrastructure, Zootopia and the ITN to our members so that they see it, they see how to use it and then they can need to go in and run a node on the ITN, they need to run a node in Zootopia and then they need to build the application on top of Zootopia. So we have um, bin track. Essentially, they are Zootopia and they all track and trace uh, and, and you either track a vehicle uh, and then once you do registration and titling a vehicle, you can do other things like uh, the floor plan audit, which I just mentioned. Uh, you can use uh, road usage charge, which is a, a big conversation right now going on. And vehicle repair and maintenance tracking and mission tracking. We did that pilot with the EU Commission. Uh, JRC last year, um, they want to see if the vehicle can self-report emission. 
and then you have uh, usage based insurance you can build on top and, and, and many, many you know, more use cases. These are just the one that our members uh, say that they are important and we're working on them. And of course, the, the battery passport, uh, we're working with our members on the standards for that and how to report it out using a decentralized method. And next week, we're pushing out a standard actually on the, the guideline on how to create the battery, global battery passport uh, in a decentralized implementation ecosystem. And then we have one that's mass multimodal uh, so that the user can plan, reserve and pay uh, for a, a multimodal trip all in one place instead of having many apps and platforms. So I will stop here. See any questions? Thank you, This has been great. For that last, if, if you could go back to that last slide, the pilot you mentioned with the EU on emissions tracking, have there been any results on that yet? Yes, um, we Did have, a, yeah, so we have a report. Let me see, I can go on to our website and deposit this here. Great. Um, yes, so let me see. Too many to screen now. Let me. <laughs> and the pilot is um, it's vehicle. So if you go to this link, here's where's the report. Let me link it real quick. Yeah. Okay, here is the page for it. And then okay. to go directly to the report. If you scroll down on the page, you can see it an icon for the oh, report. I see it. Perfect. Thank you so much. And this is a report written by JRC. Okay. Oh, excellent. Thank you. This looks like a really good resource. A lot of okay. details. Yeah. <laughs> including hyperledger fabric. I see hyperledger fabric down mm -hmm. under section four. Mm -hmm. Good. Any other questions? Yeah, Tram, this is uh, Tom Klein uh, here. Thank you very much for uh, sharing the overall picture of Moby. Good, good stuff. And uh, I got the picture of standards plus Web3 infrastructure is where you guys are focusing. So the question mm -hmm. is around go governance and mm -hmm. How does it work? What, what do you get for your money if you join, right? Uh -huh. And how do you how do you get to have your influence or decisions made? Those kind of things. Since uh, one of my contentions is blockchain, one of the reasons why things have not taken off quite as fast is how do you how do you get people to work together, right? So it'd be interesting to hear your experiences on, you know, here's some things that we tried that didn't work, and here's some things that have worked here. Yeah. And here's, here's what we're not sure about still. Yes. So um, let me see if I can like think of everything. <laughs> that we've it learned. doesn't need to be everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah, in the past five years. But essentially, I mean, within Moby, we are a democracy. We have a voting system, but it's, it's only a democracy if you actually show up and vote, right? If you don't show up and vote, then you can't complain. Um, and and so <laughs> so um, so that's that's how we choose you know the use cases and all that. And then if you um, decide to run a node on the ITN or Zootopia, which we recommend, so not, don't just use the service; you actually run the node. Then you can make money later on when when we're in production. Um, so within them. Uh, we, we would have two types of shareholders. The class A shares are the node operators, and they are the governance of, of the governance body of the networks, the two networks. Um, and they get to vote, they get to decide, they get to do all that. And they also have a board of director and be able to hire uh, executive team. And then the B shares are the ones that get um, dividends after if, if there is, of course, any revenue and any um gains them you the b shares will get uh, dividends and those don't get to participate in the governance unless they also run a node um and and the only the one vote the one major vote that they get um to do 
um, is if all the class Asia decided to say that, okay, we're just gonna like give up give only ourselves all the money and the B share, forget about it, then they can, they can rise up and revolt and say, no, you can't do that. Um, so within Mobi membership, you can run a note and have an A share, and then you can also get incentive to come in early. As an early adopter, you get a little bit of the B share as well. And if your VC arm decide to also uh, invest more, then you get more of the B share. And then outside investor gets it as well. Okay. Good. Did that so, 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 so yes. So I think what, what you're saying oh. here is democracy is basically a voting system modeled on democracy here. I have class A and class B shares um, here. One, you got to be a node operator to be a class A, and then you can participate in the governance and be you're you're you're, you're kind of a passive party here if you're class All B. Right. Okay. Yes. Got it. Uh, yeah. And then. Um, Education, I find, is extremely important. So essentially, this is um, a new way of doing things. So, and and you need to learn the language. So before you can write poetry, all that you need to learn the alphabet. And we we see that at first we's like, okay, here here is the direction on how to run a note. And we we heard crickets, maybe one or two companies and get it. Um, so now this year has been about education to our members about what did our VC are, and then walk through the code, and even like walk through the did diagram and explain uh, if if you are the battery, then you're the subject. Who's the did controller? How do you pass it on? How do you change things? So, so all that needs a lot of education um, to be able to explain this whole new way of doing things, and and um, I think that's really important in any consortium is education to be able to produce these kind of classes so our members get it um, and then the tech team can get it. And then you need the business people and the tech people to have the same language because the business people can get excited and then they go back to their team and say to the tech team, oh, can you do this? And the tech team will be what? <laughs> and, and vice versa. So if you can teach the tech team the language as well, then they can tell the business people, hey, you, you want to do this. There's a way to do this now that we couldn't do before. So they, they really do need to be on the same page as well. Yeah. And how, how incentivize are people to actually, like you said, you need to show up to vote, right? <laughs> I mean, are, are you finding that I need to give them extra incentives or just by them paying, hey, they're motivated enough? Or, I mean, there's always the politics. Somebody might sponsor it and say, you know, they get moved on to a different or part of the organization, and then it, some of the this momentum gets lost there. So interested okay. in what, what you've done about that. Yes, I, I totally agree. Um, Moby's been around now for five years. Uh, we launched in May. And so there were the early adopters, and now there's a current adopter, which is later than them. And how do you keep them all engaged? That is the hard part, I agree. Uh, because early adopter might get frustrated and say, this is get too slow. And then later adopters still don't know the language yet. Um, so so this is is like we constantly having to educate and having to get the ecosystem come in and do pilots. Um, recently, we, as I mentioned, there's two auto, uh, auto manufacturer that did a pilot and it was exciting for the ecosystem to see. So now more people want to do it. And um, so it's, it's constant. It's, it's a little bit exhausting <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> And, uh, but, but, uh, you know, I, I have to say, as long as I feel like I'm learning something new every day, which I do, then I, I can wake up the next day, even though the day before I was exhausted and say, ah, oh, forget it. Um, so it's, it's, it's a constant thing. And, and I'm, I'm seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I'm hoping it won't take five more years, um, but it's, it's a slow process to move um, all the industry players along. Um, and I think the reason why crypto, you know, it moved fast is because they're not really industry, right? They, they individual organization that can make a uh, decision really fast. They all started a startup not too long ago. Um, industry are much slower. They're much more conservative. They have uh, rules, regulation. The comms department can stop anything. The uh, legal department can stop anything if they don't understand it. So it takes a lot of education um, to to move them. Uh, but the most important thing is government buy-in. Uh, from the beginning, I've always said if we 
we can think that what we're doing is so cool, if government doesn't buy in on it, it's not going to go very far. And there's a reason why crypto is still in the billion dollar industry and then all the um, other organization within Mobi coming together is a multi-trillion dollar industry. It's because you need standards, you need government buy-in, you need structure uh, on how to do things. Uh, and then everybody needs to agree on that uh, before we can move forward. Good, mm -hmm. thank you. It's very, very helpful. So you have more, just one question on your business model. So if I'm a Mobi customer, do I pay a license over some time or do I pay for transactions, some small fraction? So so they, they're not going to be Mobi customer because Zootopia and ITN are separate. Um, I'm hoping in a year or so, they will become their own entities and, and then Mobi will continue to do the data schema standards for all the use cases. And then Zootopia and ITN business model is really simple, AP, API call charges, and that's it. Okay. Does anyone else here have any other questions right now? I wanna be mindful of time. It is it is 12.58, so I don't, in, in, here in Eastern time zone. Tram, this has been, very illuminating like you have grown so much as a company since the last time i saw you present the amount of work you've gotten done is really impressive and so many different lot. pilots it seems so slow but thank you for saying <laughs> that. because i think the last time when you came in to speak to the social impact sig i believe that was summer of 2020 oh okay and what I remember from that mainly was the battery passport. Mm -hmm. And uh, talking about the VIN track and the different pilots there and set up mass, you have gotten so much done in this time. And it's really exciting to see the amount of partnerships you've been able to create and the standards you're developing. So thank I want to you. really thank you for coming in and sharing this with us. Yes, yeah, it was you. excellent. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Does anyone have any last minute questions? Okay. Trim, will you be able to share your deck with, with the group? Um, let me look through it. Is that okay? Okay. And then yeah, of course. Then I can put um watermark or something on it and then send it Perfect. to you. Perfect. If you send it to me and let me know if I can share it, then I can share it, then I can send it out with the group and also post it to the agenda for this meeting. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. With that said, I'm going to let everybody go. Our next meeting is on June 29th, same time, same place, and we'll be doing more work on the ebook. Bye, everybody. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Tram, and to everybody else. Hey, everybody. Thank, Thank you, Tram. Thanks, everybody. Have a great Bye. day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.